two kids take on the Empire. When their parents are kidnapped by the Empire while exploring the far reaches of wild space, Milo and Lena Graff set out to rescue them. With their monkey lizard, Mork, and their family droid, Crater, Milo and Lena fly their parents' starship, the Whisperbird, to the remote planet of Thun to ask an old friend for help. But the evil Captain Corda has set a trap for them. Will Milo and Lena be able to escape? <laughs> Younglings, and welcome to the 83rd episode of Padawan Library, the Return of the Jedi 1983 episode, of course. Uh, No, we're not talking about Return of the Jedi, we're talking about Star Wars Junior novels, and today we're talking about Adventures in Wild Space, The Snare by Kevin Scott. I'm Levi Paratic, and with me as always, a man who I think sometimes act like he's 83, Tim May. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's there was just a very vi- visual moment as Tim was yeah, uh, before I introduced him. Podcast. He was looking down, not even looking up, and then as soon as I said his name, he ripped his glasses <laughs> off and stared right at me. So. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it is I, Tim, your co-host. <laughs> 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 All right, so yeah, this week we're covering Adventures in Wild Space. We're technically starting the series, even though it's yes, this really... is book one, <laughs> technically yeah, book two. So confusing. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts on this cover too. Well, we'll get this, we'll get to all of it. We'll get into know. those. Um, we'll get into those. But I wanted to share. Before we get into our se- our first subject that we already had pre-planned this week, <laughs> I just wanted to mention because you know we both love a good Gaga. I got me the I, uh, <laughs> the, the Gaga Oreos, baby. I, I really, I saw those <laughs> at Circle K, and I like was laughing pretty hard. I was like, I should really just get one of these and ship it down to uh, down to Levi. Uh, yeah, no, there's for some reason Lady Gaga sponsored Oreos. They're they're Chromatica sponsored. Yeah. On the packaging, they say a cookie inspired by Lady Gaga. <laughs> And, and then it says, inspired by her. and then, Explain. and then, and, okay, hang on, let me say the next line. In Chromatica, no one thing is greater than another. Oh, wow. So, they're Chromatica themed, and what Does makes it, them... It tastes, ins- tastes just like Lady Gaga. <laughs> yes, well, because they here's what they're described as on the package: a pink colored golden cookie with a green cream. So I would read that as like a golden Oreo kind of thing. Sure. That's what I expected them to be. Um, they are pink. They have the Chromatica logo on oh one side God, of them. These are elaborate. Uh huh. And then they have this green cream filling, which I would say is actually a double stuffed cream filling. It doesn't say that. Um, however, it doesn't taste like a. Um, a golden Oreo it tastes like a holiday cookie. Like I get real Christmas cookie vibes out huh. of this thing. So like decent Christmas cookies. Yeah, they're decent. Like I don't love. I like, thought and about getting it, them. It the... vaguely looks like a Christmas cookie too, because yeah. like the it's you, like you could like read it green, as red. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially when we're talking about like a wafer, like it, like pink reads as red. I feel like. It, yep, I agree. Mm-hmm. All so. Right. But wow. hey, there can be a hundred people in a room and ninety nine of them don't <laughs> like your Oreo cookie. But all it takes is one person to dunk that cookie uh, in milk and say, "Yes, that cookie." <laughs> oh my god! Okay, so I uh, I think 
feel like there needs to be more like musician branded. Uh, well, fast, the Travis, like, the Travis Scott burger. Yeah, I don't care about him at all. Though. Like, what you didn't love his collaboration with Ludwig and the credit sequence of Tenet? Oh yeah, I guess that was a f- okay. I, I I don't hate him or anything. He just I don't have any attachment to <laughs> Den- him. Denny any opinions? Yeah, like so. I, yeah, I'm not against Travis Scott, but yeah. The, the tenant score overall is a masterpiece. So. I agree. Yeah, that's um, incredible. Uh, that song, though, that Travis Scott song to me reads a little bit like a uh, Yeezus era Kanye song. Well, that's, that's, you're that's asking the, me. I don't need to get deep into it, but that's the whole <laughs> thing with Travis Scott. He just. Whatever. He's. I don't view him as a particularly interesting artist for mm-hmm. for that reason. Um, anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Very, uh, very derivative. Not that, whatever. I don't want to explain. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Obvi- so, obviously, he is a fan. So, I. Uh, so yeah, this week we are doing Adventures in Wild Space: The Snare, and as we've been doing this season, we're covering movies, TV shows, potentially music at some point that mm-hmm. has some tangential, titular connection. To the book we're covering, we could not find any. Last week, we, you heard us sh- struggle, struggle last week to find anything, and we, I was like, snare. It's like a trap. Well, it's a trap thing, and we came mm-hmm. up with the 1982 uh, murder, not mystery really, but uh, you know, murder farce. Uh, who done it? Who done it? Kind of. Mm-hmm. But we know. Well, uh, anyway. Death Trap, which is uh, based on an Ira Levin play. Ira Levin, of course, is the author of Rosemary's Baby, the novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, also did uh, Stepford Wives. Stepford Wives, is... yeah. A pretty significant, popular uh, fiction writer of the 60s and 70s. And he had a very a big hit play called Death Trap in the late 70s. And the, this is the film version, 1982. It's directed by Sidney Lumet. stars Michael Caine, Christopher Reeve, and Diane Cannon. Uh, and I had always I I'd always been curious about this movie. I always loved the poster where like it's it's the three this, the three leads it, trapped in a Rubik's cube. Which yep, that's it. That doesn't it. really connect to the movie and, at all. But and and not, not only that does that not connect to the movie, but they say it's uh they all the posters say a wickedly funny whodunit. Okay. And this this movie's not uh this movie's funny at times, but I wouldn't say wickedly. I funny. think the movie's it's very. Sort of I think it's a very fun movie. I I often see mm-hmm. it labeled a comedy and there's comedic elements but i would not call it it's not like a mystery comedy it's more of a straightforward no mystery Mm -hmm. it's like a very silly like absurd on a plotting level mystery but it's not like the tone is is pretty straight i would say um Mm -hmm. it's a lot kind of it's a it's very similar i don't know if you've seen sleuth with michael Caine no i have early 70s it kind of has that vibe his character it's it's you know, and, and you go into like a more serious zone with this, like kind of the- these kinds of themes in crimes and misdemeanors with Michael Caine. Uh, much later, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, oh, let's just explain the basic premise because I actually don't know how much we want to get into specifics because the, okay. there are well, some pretty the... big spoilers. I, yes. So let's talk. A little broadly let's, first. Let's let's talk the well. There's some big surprises in this yes. movie. There were two moments in this film where I was like, "Whoa, yeah. shock!" Yeah, no, there were um, some real shocks. <laughs> I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" All right. First, so a oh, well, I'll say uh, a very sinister Michael Caine. Right. This is the initial setup. He is a playwright who is on a losing streak, and a former student from one of his classes uh, wrote a play and sent it to him and he thinks the play is very good and then he plots uh, his wife knows about this he plots She's to an un- invite yeah. him to, out to his Montauk country home his windmill yeah, which by the way, the house is fucking awesome. That's like my favorite <laughs> part of this movie. It's so fucking cool. Like every aspect of the production design, I was like, this just rules. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like a windmill house, and like he has like this. There's this centered, in the Hamptons. In the Hamptons, this centered fireplace, like that stacks like bricks, like you know, it's a little mm-hmm. pyramid fireplace, and there's like yep. this cool staircase. It's like it is. 
a wild set, like a very cool set. Yeah, because the master bedroom is like has this canopy bed, and the room itself is like the gear room of yeah, like the it, uh, the windmill like too. Going, so, like, like, there's, like above like gears you. above them yeah. that like are spinning. So very cool. It's stuff. wild. I, uh, but yeah, so he, he plots to invite this uh, former student uh, out to his home and murder him and steal mm-hmm. his play. Uh, and he, he's talking about it with his wife, and she kind of thinks he might be joking, but it's like he's also being very dead serious. But how much of that is just like Michael Caine being dry? We don't know. Uh, right. And then, she suggests that they should partner. He should produce the play. She's the voice of reason in this and whole so thing. And so I don't really think... In, if, if you want to watch this movie, if this sounds like an intriguing setup for a movie, I would say stop listening now, because... Mm-hmm. I don't think we can get much deeper without giving, like, substantial... Splits. Substantial plot. So, and Kane, by the way, is the writer. The the young uh, mm-hmm. student is Christopher Reeve, and Diane Cannon is his wife. And they're really And bef- before you tune out, if you think you're going to watch this movie, I will say this about this movie. This put Mel to sleep. Oh, really? Like, wow. Pretty quickly. But before before things got interesting. So, like, mm. if you think this movie's dragging a little bit, you give it time because it will I shock you. I thought it you. went pretty... I thought it was pretty quick in general. Um, I... Uh, okay, so what happens is he, he seemingly he kills, Christopher. kills Christopher Reeve. Christopher. Right. Uh, and that was, like, the shocking to me because the way he does it, like, the whole sequence is, like, rather violent and then, like, blood shows up and I was like, whoa. <laughs> like, it's yeah. really surprising. Absolutely. Me. It's, like, it's a really, like, you know, this is a very kind of, like, clearly based on a play, very a pretty stagey premise mm-hmm. and movie, but... Especially because the only location is really the house. Yeah, it barely leaves the house. So... There's, uh, but, uh, that sequence, like, shows what, why you bring in Sidney Lumet to do a movie like this, because, like, you could see a more, a much limper version in terms of the directing, uh, mm-hmm. but, like, there's, like, this, like, there's this thing that starts kind of at, because, because they have, he has Reeve tied up, like, or, or locked to handcuffed. a chair, handcuffed yeah. to a chair. And like, there's a like this shot that goes from like his clenched fist, like it like kind of pushes in upward on him. That is like, and like the lighting kind of changes. Like, it's pretty cool. Like, there's some very cool like blocking going on, mm-hmm. especially in that sequence, and then another later sequence. But uh, so he kills him though, buries him in the garden, buries him in the garden, burns all the evi- other evidence of the manuscript out, out besides the manuscript of the play. Uh, his, uh, Kane's wife, uh, Diane Cannon, is, uh, freaking out. Uh, mm-hmm. She's she, already got a heart condition. She's got a heart condition. She thinks she hears something downstairs, and he, and, but, and but, Kane but, forces her. But, 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 wait, you're forgetting a character. The, oh, so, right. uh, Michael yeah. Kane, Michael Kane, Sydney is his, uh, his, the character, Sydney. the Sasha character name. name. Yeah. Yeah. Sydney, he has his next idea for a play is based on his next door neighbor who he's actually never met, but she is like a psychic. So it's like a who done it, but with like a psychic involved. And she and like he, comes over after they bury, uh, Christopher Reeve. Christopher Reeve, and they yeah. think and, and and she's like seemingly knows something is going on. She thinks something's about to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, she's feeling uh, pain, pain everywhere. And, so uh, yeah. So and then they they try to go to bed that night, and uh, yeah, uh, the wife is freaking out. Thinks she hears something downstairs, and uh, Kane forces her. To go confront it and show her that nothing is outside, and it's at this point that crashing through the window is Christopher Reeve come from out of the ground <laughs> and terrifies her, and she has a heart attack. Yeah, and dies he see he seemingly spot. beats like Michael Caine to death with a log, and yeah. then scares her to the point that she has a heart attack and dies. Which 
this is the major twist yeah, of the yeah, story yeah. is that you find out that Michael Caine and Christopher Reeves were conspiring. Uh, this was a whole plotted effort to get her to have a heart attack and die. Um, and that the two of them are lovers. Yeah, it was truly shocking. I was shocked. Mm-hmm. And I actually looked and they actually kiss. Which mm-hmm, apparently they, do. They, they didn't in the play, the two characters. It was just implied. Uh, and uh, I was looking into this. Apparently lots of people thought, like, lots of, like, Chris Free got a lot of shit for this at the time. Oh, I believe that, and, yeah. Oh, I'm not surprised by it, I'm just saying. And apparently, like, a lot of people think that it hurt his career, like, going forward. Because if you actually, if you look past, like, he had substantial roles outside of Superman through this point. Like it's, mm-hmm. but if you look past this, like he basically keeps making the Superman movies and gets like kind of lower rent roles in movies. There's not like a, um, like he kind of stops being in movies of this kind of pedigree, mm-hmm. which is unfortunate. Uh, but he also loved playing. He was like a he was a much more versatile actor, I think, than people remember. Like, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean, I love him in the Superman movies, but like. You, I, he's so like he's he's playing so many different things in this movie. Like he, yeah, he. So you have like the beginning part where you think he's just this kind of uh, naive student, and but he's but he turns out to be a really smart guy and very like, sinister. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. and so then the rest of the movie is kind of a cat and mouse game about like because eventually it becomes like that Reeves' character wants to write this as, like, write this experience as a play and present it, and, like, the Kane character's like, people know you work for me, because he's working as his secretary. Right. People know you work for me, and, like, you're not changed, like, no no details about this are changed, they're just going to assume that, like we actually did this and like he's just like that'll be great for business like people will be like who <laughs> is he a criminal and uh it's like it's uh it's a very i think that this is what i'll say about this movie broadly i was like fully 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 in until the last like five minutes of this movie yeah you didn't like that end it does kind of abruptly end. It ends in a weird way where it involves the psychic where eventually, like, I thought it was, I mean, literally the la- the ending, I thought, was, like, just kind of, like, it felt like the ending to a pure comedy. Mm-hmm. And, like, I felt like the movie was, like, playing with some more interest, like, some more, like, more dramatic ideas, really. Maybe that's, like, it. maybe the tone of how the play was staged, like... It fits better mm-hmm. for that, but, like, I felt like... Because she... Essentially, they both wind up killing each other, Reeve and uh, and Kane, and she essentially takes the manuscript of the play and... Uh, and She, she, and she releases it herself. It and it becomes a huge hit, which is a funny, like, ending, but I thought it was, like... I don't know what else I would have done. I'm not, you know, I'm not Ira Levin, mm-hmm. but... Um. <laughs> well, I was actually, like, interested to know, like, how that actually, like, played out on stage. Because, like, the joke at the end is, like, it it's suddenly... You're at the end, where with Michael Caine and Christopher Reeves, and then it cuts. And then you cut to the stage version of it with different actors. And it's real brief. You don't really get, like, a solid ending, because then it shortly cuts to the psychic. Yeah. But it's like, if that's the joke in the play, how do you substitute, like, you know, your players that are already in stage for a fake play? So that was what I was uh, curious about this. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I the play was very successful. Like it's one of the longest running dramatic plays in Broadway history. I think it ran, mm. it ran for like four years straight and which for a non-musical is extremely long. Mm-hmm. Um, and it had like Victor Garber was in the Christopher Reeve role and blanking on who was in the Kane role. But like, uh, and it, it was, I think it was nominated for best play at the Tonys and like, it was a big hit and it's been revived a couple times here or there. But like this, I will say, I thought, again, like, I was, like, pretty much all in on the movie until the very end. And I didn't, like, it didn't ruin the movie by any means. Like, it's not, like, a total whiff of an ending that, like, if 
fucks it all up, but I thought it was, like, a very entertain. It's high-level entertainment. Like, I don't think it's, like, it's not a masterpiece or anything, but it's, like, a very, like, you got great movie stars. I mean, Kane, we haven't really talked about him, but he is so fun in this movie. Like, he's doing, <laughs> he's doing so much fun stuff, and I love, like, and I, I, I do think a lot of younger people... You know, they only know the old man Kane, but, like, Kane, mm-hmm. like, I mean, this is, he's getting older at this point, but, like, this is still Kane, kind of, and, because, like, I love, like, him and, like, Hannah and her sisters, the Woody Allen movies in the late 80s, like, Hannah and her sisters mm-hmm. and, and, and Crimes and Misdemeanors, like, this era of him, like, the de- 80s is, like, an incredible decade for Kane, like, he's just, he's just awesome in everything, and he, like, <laughs> he, he can be funny and, like, sinister and... Yeah very warm like he's able to do all of it and like a lot of that is there in this performance uh he's uh yeah and and reeve like i said like i i wish he got to do more stuff he's also just i mean he also falls prey to like how like how handsome he is it's hard to cast him in certain roles but Mm -hmm. but But he plays this role very sinisterly you can never tell like when he's being like serious or like just being funny like he just has like that there's a blankness to him but what year did he do jaws oh uh kane that's in the 80s that's like 83 or 84 oh then that would be like the year after after i mean yeah that's terrible but he was he had a very good decade in the 80s like he, he made a lot of good movies i I, sh- I heard I, I heard a story once where he said, I've never seen Jaws, but I am quite fond of the addition it put on my house. Jaws so, the Revenge, but... by the way, for people that don't know. The fourth Jaws movie. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's uh, he rules. Like, I love Michael Caine. I can't believe he still, like, is around. Like, he's, we just saw him in Tenet, you know, for his one scene. Christopher Nolan cameo. And yep. He's That's Sir Michael. Delightful in that. You know, I... Uh, I, I think, uh, but yeah, like, if you like, I would say if you like, just kind of, it's like a drawing room mystery, it's not real, like, it's complicated, what do you call it, like, a whodunit, or, like, you kind of know what's going on, like, things are revealed, but then once the new thing's revealed, like, you're kind of on solid footing, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, so it's like, yeah, I know exactly, it's, it's not like, you're not constantly wondering who's, who's, like, like, you know that both of them are... Like, once you know that both of them are in on it, you know that both of them are trying to fuck each other over. It's not like a... Mm-hmm. It, like, there's no, like... It, like, it it jumps... It, it basically just makes a jump in the first act from one premise to another, is what it does. Right. And, like, but once you're in the other premise, you got it. You know what's going to end up happening, so... Yeah. I, uh... Well, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, this movie was fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Like, I, got, I, I, again, I, I think if you like that kind of thing, like, and if you've seen, like, you know, if you like, like, Agatha Christie stuff, or if you liked Knives Out last year, like, I think it's mm-hmm. definitely something you would enjoy. Like, it's just a very, very handsomely mounted, like, the set, I can't get, a, like, that is the one <laughs> truly transcendent thing about the movie. I was like, like and I looked it up and like not even nominated for production design. I'm like, what the mm. fuck is? I mean, I know that's they only had to build one set, but that is a <laughs> set right there. That's what I'm uh, yeah, so oh, it's so funny too because like there's the after he kills the wife, he like lies to Christopher Reeves about like the value of the house. He's like, it's only worth seventy thousand dollars. And I was like, even like that. eighty-two. That is like <laughs> no, no way. And it, like, <laughs> what did they say? It's like eight acres in the Hamptons. Like, yeah, and it's like this. Piece beautiful windmill and like just like mm-hmm. yeah no like that's fucking even in 1982 that's like a million well, dollars well obviously christopher reeves is the one he was his character was uh he fell for it because he was like haha it's worth millions well, he's talking I about how broke you. he is the whole time and then like he says that like oh she only left me forty two thousand dollars and then he about that winds up being a lie that she actually had way more money than <laughs> like like <laughs> this like i do like i always enjoy like things that are this kind of like just out to entertain you that also have super contemptible characters where you're just like these people are all scumbags you know <laughs> but yeah it's uh 
the fun. And I also love anything with the theater world is fun, where, like, oh, it's like, oh, the reviews are terrible. Like, the, the critics, how about Joel Siegel from Good Morning <laughs> yeah, America know. at the beginning? You see him on the screen, he's just like, no, no, no. Like, I, <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping he'd come back for a cameo at the end of it. Like, like he would be, like, walking out of Death Trap. <laughs> I but... <laughs> wish Gene Shallot was in there. Like, that would be so funny, Gene Shallot. Yeah, I, uh... <laughs> I was like for some reason on the Wikipedia page for funny people earlier today and uh, mm-hmm. a movie I, I love I don't know <laughs> but um, and I, in the critical reception they, they had a thing from Gene Shalit like where he panned the movie and he was just like it's ineffable in that in that Apatow doesn't know how to do anything without without a million F's or something like Fuck, like fuck like I was like yeah. so bad it's like the corniest <laughs> fucking blind I've ever heard well, um, that that made me think I, I should mention I started watching Love finally. That's a fun the show. The produced yeah. show. I've, I've watched two episodes of that, and that is hilarious so far. That's good. It's, People should check that mm-hmm. out. It's like got an incredible cast. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and it feels and it's like very it, to me. It's very authentic Los Angeles. Oh, sure, like yeah. if you want to know what it's like to live in Los Angeles, watch Love. Yeah, exactly. Terrible. So. Yeah, it's awful. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely um, terrible. Yeah, it's just like, oh, cool. <laughs> I live in, like, a shitty apartment that would be, like, fucking $600 a month anywhere else in the country. It'll be, you know, $4,000 a month. Yeah, and... it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, this is trash anyway <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> love how i'm just talking shit around a place i've never lived it's yeah fine. well you never will and i never will either yeah, i've been fine. there and i'm just like no yeah, never no, ever no, it's like a fine it's a tor- tourist location that's it that's mm-hmm. i uh, <laughs> anyway uh, i uh sorry to our listeners in los angeles if we have any uh I'm sure you're, you know, making good life choices. Uh, so, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> um, that sounded so I, I, I know. I'm sorry again. I, I, as soon as I said it, I was like, nope. This, nope. I apologize again. Uh, you know, they, they all have a good sense of humor about it. They all whine about mm-hmm. it. I, you know, whatever. I, well, nobody's from California, actually. Yeah, yeah. So it's, they all or came at least there. that part of California, anyway. Right. I, so yeah, I. Uh, as as in the words of Billy Joel, Los Angeles all come from somewhere oh, to live in sunshine yeah, and he's with a, he's, their with their New York cowboys. Yeah, and he's an East Coast boy, Billy Joel. As I, I, I respect <laughs> it, you know, fucking, you know, if I, yeah, like whatever. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right so next week uh well should we announce that now or later we might as well announce it now all and right. we'll so announce it week, again at the end but. next week's book book two of adventures in wild space the nest our companion next week will be watching the pilot episode of the 1988 golden girl spinoff empty nest indeed uh <laughs> so i hope uh you guys, we don't know exactly where you can watch it. I'm sure it's available somewhere. Uh, we'll find it if need be. Uh, but yeah, no, like I would recommend uh, Death Trap. By the way, if you if you can watch it, it's a fun movie. Uh, you know, and it, you get good movie star performances, and that's you know that's mm-hmm. all you can ask for from a movie. Yep, like it this. is qual it's quality entertainment, and like it will surprise you. I mean... It won't be. If you listen to this It won't now. It won't. We gave the whole movie away, but... but we gave you a warning and you should uh, get over it. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Empty Nest itself had its own spinoff. Jeez. Nurses. Oh, I think I might have read about this. I go down Wikipedia rabbit holes about spinoffs all the time. Like, try to find full, like the biggest TV universes. <laughs> well, Golden Girls apparently has it, so... Well, no, um, the biggest of all time is... Whatever, I don't even need to get into it. The Tommy Westfall universe, look it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, when we come back, Adventures in Wild Space 1, technically book 2, The Snare by Kevin Scott. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Padawan Library, the Star Wars 
Junior Novel Podcast. My name is Tim May, and here, as always, with me is my co-host and friend, Levi Paratic. Thank you, friend. You're my <laughs> friend, too. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this week, we've got... We're, the, the, we're beginning in earnest the Adventures in Wild Space series, which is, again, for those of you who maybe missed last week, is a uh, relatively recent uh, current canon series. Uh, uh, that book, the, the preview book from last week and this one are both written by Kevin Scott or Kevin Scott. I'm not... Not exactly sure on the pronunciation there. Uh, and we they are illustrated. Hang on, by oh, yes. um, David uh, Busan, uh, or uh, yeah, I'm going to say Busan. And uh, yeah, yeah. he also did the cover art for the UK release of this book. Yes, and which the they US... came out before the US version. Yes, they did. And the cover art in the US has been done by Lucy Ruth Cummins. And if you uh, look at the two covers side by side, um, they are basically just like rotoscope silhouettes of the original covers. Uh, this book, however, is actually far less detailed. Uh, than the UK cover. All the UK covers have the kids, the graph children, at the bottom of them. And then in the US, in every single book cover, they are silhouetted uh, from that pose, rotoscoped. And then uh, this one uh, book in the UK also has... Uh, Ka- What's the guy's name? Uh, the uh, the evil dude. Uh, Kandor, is that his no, name? No, it's... Uh, uh, it's Corda. Corda. Captain. Corda, Captain Corda on it, uh, and of course the big boat sequence in this book. There is a, I'm happy we have a big boat sequence finally. In Always book. happy. Um, but uh, yeah, so these cover, these U.S. covers are not only just rotoscoped, uh, they also have no book number on them and no author. On this the cover, is the yeah. true. This is the true disrespect of this that they don't even put the author's name on the cover of this book. Yeah, and so. That's very frustrating. You have to open up the title page to see Kevin Scott's name. The other thing, to, the other big design element here is that above the Star Wars logo on all these, there's a some sort of like kind of Eric Carl core uh, <laughs> illustration. Yeah, it does look like tissue paper, yeah, like yeah. Eric Carl, <laughs> like pasted it like tissue paper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and this one has uh, Tie Fighters on it, but. So, yeah, uh, we left off last week with uh, these two kids, Milo and Lena, and their parents uh, are uh, cartographers shortly after the rise of the Empire, the end of the Clone Wars, and they wind up getting kidnapped by the Empire, captured by the Empire to essentially map the outer rim and wild space for uh, for the for the empire, uh, and they think that the kids died in uh, an explosion in a cave, but they had escaped and they are off to the planet Thun, where they're going to find try to find a friend of their parents to help them uh, find their parents. So correct, we pick up with them in their ship, which is called the. Uh, the Whisper Bird. The Whisper Bird. They're in the Whisper Bird, and things are going haywire. Like, they're losing power, there's all sorts of panic in the cockpit, and uh, they have to get into the engine room, but the door to the engine room is stuck. They can't open it. So, brave older sister Lena is going to get walk outside the ship in a spacesuit, crawl to the engine compartment, go inside from the outside. Um, it's big risky, big scary. They've just come out of light speed and they are hurtling towards the planet. So she has to go into the engine room. She fixes the engine, gets stuck in there, gets super hot, but it's okay. They land safely, uh, with the help of their, uh, droid, uh, crater, uh, who was at the hands piloting it with Milo. Uh, so they get to the planet Thune and then, uh, quick, oh, oh. Before I even forgot, uh, Crater, uh, there's an Imperial space station around the planet, and Crater, 
transmits fake IDs, fake credentials to the Empire. Which he to, didn't uh, even know he had. They have been. They didn't even know he had. C- called the ship the Star, the the Star Stormer One. Something like that. Uh, yeah, Star Stormer One. Empire accepts the codes. Turns out it came from that secret message that his their parents sent him that he is decoding still, and it's apparently twelve percent decoded by this point. The last book it was at two, uh, so we've made some progress on this decoded message. Um, but anyway, they get to the planet and they meet a bug spray salesman, popcorn. <laughs> so yeah, they meet this bug spray salesman. He's uh... Uh, oh yeah, Crater like goes off on this dude. He's like this. I don't remember what the alien species. Yeah, is. I thought I I he was like said some mean yeah, things he, to this. And he said yeah. like you know this species isn't trustworthy. Like yeah, all this kind of <laughs> stuff. And then he turns out to be legitimately untrustworthy. Which yeah, I was just he, like I don't <laughs> love. Listen, it's not holy it's not a creation of books or anything it, it, it exists to some degree in the movies but like not a huge fan of it when aliens have like inherent qualities mm-hmm. <laughs> like character flaws and problems not a great thing i feel like especially for I... like a like it's one thing like with the earlier stuff because you had like you know who knows whatever based on these archetypes but once the universe is at this expansive level and you're like introducing a new alien race and you're like they're gonna be greedy and evil like it's well this "Eh." this i feel like from the photo this these creatures have showed up in clone wars before okay maybe Uh, yeah yeah i uh, I remember for sure Okay, yeah, I remember one of these, what I think is this one of these guys in Clone Wars. But Crater on page 43, he says, You'll never meet a more dishonest bunch of group than the Jablonians. The J- Jablogians. <laughs> You'll, ne- You'll Jablogians. never meet a, more dis- a bunch of crooks than the Jablogians. So, like, <laughs> and then, like, um,. Oh, and then, like, uh... They buy the bug spray, because there's a lot the of They buy the bug spray, and it winds up just being, like, shitty sewer water. Uh, does it, it, it attracts more bugs, even, and, and he, he, he biffed them. So he did screw them. He is, like, a dishonest thieving... <laughs> thieving Jablogian, or whatever. And, uh... That becomes the whole thing... Uh, yes, because it, it turns out they're uh, the lizard monkey uh, Milo. No, Milo's uh, the kid. Lizard monkey's Mork. Oh, Mork, Mork. Is he, Mork do you think and... he's from Mork? <laughs> he could be. Yeah. I keep thinking of Mork and Mindy yeah, every I time I, I read the name Mork. Um, but Mork, he uh, he steals a real bottle of the bug spray, which comes into play uh, later in the book. Uh, so anyway. Um, they uh, have to go meet uh, their parents' connection. Uh, Lena, or Lena, she says, I'm going alone. I'm the oldest. You have to stay here, Milo. Um, so this, their connection is Dill Preston. And yeah, and, Dill uh, Preston, he, uh, they talk to him and he, he admits that, like, he, th- because remember, all these characters thought the Empire was good for the galaxy, so he had already, he, he tells them while they're talking on on the hollow that like he he had sent the empire their way his their parents way and like he felt really bad about it and he's just like i'll bring this information that you have stored in your droid uh Mm -hmm. and so lena goes by herself along with mork to uh meet up with uh what's his face the guy dill preston dill preston which sounds so much like a Mad Men name or something like that. Yeah, like, it's yeah, such Del, a real name. Oh, no, it's like Duck Phillips. Duck yep, Phillips. mm-hmm. Duck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I bet he was your oh. guy. You loved him. Oh, I, I hated know, Duck. Everyone hates Duck. I mean, <laughs> Everybody hates when, Duck. Like, Peggy's having the affair with Duck. Oh, I, oh. I feel so Can... bad for Peggy. <laughs> that she's having the affair with Duck, and then, like, he, like they're, they're meeting in a hotel room. 
the TV's on, Kennedy's been shot, and Duck's just like, I better turn this off if I want to fuck Peggy. So he turns it oh. off, and she doesn't know it's so scummy. Like, the, oh, the he's, he's just like, yeah. well, he's dead, but I'm going to fuck before she knows that. Like, because that'll put her out of the mood. So, classic slimeball Duck Phillips. So, yeah. Ugh. And it, guess what? Dill Preston ends up becoming a slime bag too. Well, he's forced because when Lena gets there, Captain Corda from the Empire is there. Classic metal jaw Corda, yeah. and uh, he um, very kind of Lando uh, Vader thing. Yes, yes, because basically they have a whole bunch of shit on Dill that he's going to go to prison for life if he doesn't cooperate. Yeah, like what uh, did he? Oh, well, I mean. Obviously, the Empire's going to punish, like, even slight crimes more heavily. But, mm-hmm. like, the way he talks about it, it's like, what kind of person were you? <laughs> like, yeah, I know. Like, he's just like, I was a piece of trash. Yeah. And I love that he's like, oh, it was your parents that turned me straight. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like he gets so intense. Uh but yeah, and so... Oh, oh and something able... we find out about Corda too. I don't know if this will uh, uh, be a factor in anything. But Corda lost his jaw to a battle droid, apparently, during the Clone oh. Wars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, anyway, that's interesting. Do you think it was uh, a, one of the tan battle droids, like the regular battle droids? Or a super I, battle hope droid? So. I hope I hope, it was I hope it's one. a... Yeah, it's, <laughs> can you imagine one of them, like, punching a guy's jaw off? <laughs> <laughs> roger roger oh god what a delight oh i love those guys those are the best rights <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, abrams thinks so that's why one showed up in rise of skywalker oh, go, got him. In, the, okay. in the background King, oh, oh i King thought you were Easter talking about Dio, his character no 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 <laughs> like in, in... Battle droid yeah he is <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh boy. Um, where, where, oh yeah, so Lena, how does she wind up escaping this situation? Well, she ends up getting captured. Right. And then Corda uh, sends a, a, a message to Milo on the ship. Uh, Milo at the moment and has Crater, been. The, the droid. Yeah, and Milo at the moment, he's been. He captured a uh, Thunian wart hornet, uh, which are very poisonous. Whenever, if they lick you with their tongues, their uh, parts of your body will swell. Uh, he's captured one of these because he's a curious boy. You know, he wanted to show his mm-hmm. papa what this cool bug he caught. Anyway. Uh, but uh, Corda calls him, and Milo, in a kind of a smart way, was like, all right, I'll give you the data that you want, because that's what they want. They want the data that is on Crater. Uh, I'll give you the data, but we got to meet somewhere in public for the handoff, you know? So they're going to go to the Merchant's Bridge. and uh, But Milo, he's got an idea. He's got a wild card in his pocket. So, so then he... Uh, what is the wild card? <laughs> The wild card are the wart hornets. Oh, so, right. Like, they, sh- yes. they show up at the bridge, and then he, a crater makes a wart hornet call, like with his his uh, vocabulator, and uh, so the Empire gets attacked by the wart hornets. So then the children and crater and Mork escape in a boat to get back to the ship. It's this big speedboat sequence. Yeah, uh, it's a like very speed two cruise control. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Everyone's favorite I was, uh, film. I was thinking of uh, of uh, Temple of uh, not Temple Last Crusade yeah, was what I was thinking of. It's mm-hmm. a very good sequence. Uh, I, I I have a very correct take that Last Crusade of the original three indie movies has the least compelling set pieces. Uh, I, I I feel like people don't acknowledge that enough. Uh, but you know that's that is what mm-hmm. it is. <laughs> That one specifically I think of as like slightly less. The 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 opening River Phoenix one rules. The I love um the one where they're the the, the motorcycle chase is good. Mm-hmm. Um like there's lots of great moments in that, but I feel like the action set pieces are a big step down from the first two. Yep. 
I, there was another theater. I don't know why that, I bring this up. <laughs> there was another. There was a theater in Zelianople, Pennsylvania, that I saw that was screening Indiana Jones, and they were doing the three. They weren't doing the four, oh. and that's like the second time I've encountered a theater that like refuses to do Crystal Skull. No one's gonna and come. That's, just, that's it, why. It's, like they need to have. Well, if, they need to show a movie if, that people are actually gonna come out for. If you're showing all, if you're showing three indie movies, you should throw the fourth in there because it's the same creative team, it's I, the same director. Listen, I agree. It, it has just as much value. I agree that it deserves as equal consideration. That doesn't mean it's as good. <laughs> no, it's 100% <laughs> and listen, not. <laughs> I just saw it again a couple years ago, and like I, I think I've talked about it on the show, that like I like... I saw the movie once in theaters, and like I had the reaction most people had to the prequels to it. Like I was very anti it for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then I saw it again, and I think the first hour of it is great. And then I think it falls off a fucking cliff and is very bad. <laughs> yeah. well, well, I love the first crazy, hour. The yeah. jungle scene where they're on so this bad. machine so that bad. is like taking down trees and it's all green screen. It's just like, it's too much. First hour it's is way very too much. fun. Like, I like the first hour. Mm-hmm. You have the motorcycle sequence. Motorcycle sequence through, through the college is very good. I like... I love the opening, including the nuke the fridge. Like that's just a that has so many great gags and like that mm-hmm. that's a delight. I like that. I like um, you know there, there's stuff I it, it's enjoyable up through about half of it. Then the second half is just like once they get to South America, it's just like it's just the the sequ- the action sequences aren't as good. And like the mystery I don't, itself is just not that. And interesting. the side, the sidekick characters like aren't like a no shots at Marion and Mutt, but there's also like that other guy who like the Ray Winstone Indian. character, yeah. Who like mm-hmm. I wish I liked more because I like him as an actor, and and I love Marion, but I'm not a huge fan of how she's characterized in that movie. Like I feel like she's kind of like just off, uh, mm-hmm. and I don't really blame Karen Allen. I just feel like it's like they decided, like, we need to, like, have a big hook rather than just give him another love interest, which would have been fine and no one would have been mad about it. Uh, just give him, you know, age appropriate, but uh, you know, But they wanted to give him a son. They wanted him. to give him this arc. And, like, he, yeah, but his son could have been from a character we've never met before. Like, we all mm-hmm. knew that he had many, many uh, flings, you know. That's a part of the character, so like, whatever. Why are we talking about Crystal Skull right now? God. Okay. <laughs> how do you think? Um, um, how do you think? Um, oh, uh, Stephen's wife felt about that. Um, okay, Capshaw. She doesn't act okay, anymore, okay. so I don't. I know, but still, she'd be like, hmm, "I could make an appearance, honey." You well, know, everyone knows. knows Marion's the best one. Come on. <laughs> well, I, and, well, the other one was a Nazi, so and she's dead. Well, so. Yeah, she's nothing. Yeah, mm-hmm. fun, fun chemistry, but like you know, yeah. Oh my gosh, when like when Henry Senior and Henry Junior both like realize that oh. they've done that one thing. <laughs> they've done that one thing. You said. Like first thing. of all, like everybody listening to this doesn't know what you're talking about. Second of all, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that scene is so funny. <laughs> Well, it's also hilarious because Harrison Ford and Sean... Harrison Ford's, like, ten years younger than Sean Connery. Like, mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. like, absurd. But, you know, uh, they feel, like, fully of different generations. But, anyway, I... I anyway, back to this book. I we should, had a big boat chase. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we had a big boat chase. We don't need to go beat by beat through the boat chase. They are able to kind of get... Re- by the way, speaking of boats and movies... Uh, you know that one, uh, you, for some reason, suffered through a bunch of the Roger Moore Bonds, even though you, like, hate them, even the good ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I watch, I, I um, that's why I haven't finished all of them, well, because, now like, you, watch... you, you've seen the best one, and you acted like it was bad, so I feel like it doesn't even matter. Uh, you shouldn't watch the other ones, they're all terrible from this point on. Well, but well, the... I, he, well, I will say this. That one has the best song. Spy, well, no shit. That Sp- song is Spy amazing. Who, Spy Who Loved I know. Me, I, by love, the way. And I, I love. I love that song. I want to just put it out there for the audience. I'm a very big Bond fan. And Spy Who Loved Me is like a top three or four Bond movie for me. And, and this guy gave it like one star on Letterbox. Another reason I, mean, I, 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 I hate I, Roger Moore. That's fine. I hate Roger I mean, Moore. You're completely wrong, but that's fine. That's fine. I just. Uh, 
And if you hate Roger Moore, you definitely shouldn't watch the later ones. They are that. Then your problems with Roger Moore become so pronounced. But anyway, so my point is, I think it, is it in uh, which one is it? I think it's in Moonraker when he's riding the gondola, arms crossed, like through the street. You know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I think it's in Moonraker. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to shout out that moment, one of my favorite moments in the mo- history of the movie. So, and not the Bond movies, the movies in general. All right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they they wind up escaping. Uh, how do they? Like, is, they get back to the ship, they, and then um, this whole they, book is essentially a big kind of. Once it gets introduces the conflict, like once Cordis shows up, it becomes essentially a big chase. And mm-hmm. oh, we didn't talk about how um, Dell. Not is it Dell or Dill or whatever. Dill, Dill, yeah. Dill, he uh, he gives the, he keeps giving them up, and he tries to get this uh, information that's stored in Crater, um, and uh, he he winds up doing everything he can, and he thinks he's like gotten off, and then they, uh, of course, Cord is just like nice try, like arrest him. He's gonna be working on like some spice mines for the rest of his life. Yep. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, damn, the Empire is fucking ruthless. So. <laughs> they are. They are. <laughs> and the way they escape is they are they get in the ship. They're pulling out. They somehow have like a map of where all like the ships, all the Imperial ships are coming to like form like a blockade. Uh, however, a Crater is able to analyze to figure out where there's an opening that they can pass through, and then they have to make like the split minute decision to make the jump to light speed in the atmosphere afraid that they'll like burst apart like not being in the atmosphere but they do it anyway they get away um they do right before this all happens they're listening to like radio transmissions and they hear one on uh what is this page 128 that confuses them but it gives them an idea so the uh the message is um where is it um, time to intercept one minute 47 do you have them repeat do you have them remember you can resist the empire for your families your freedom your very future so it's a yep it's a thing from some early rebellion group mm-hmm. uh, which once they escape, they're just like, well, if they're against the empire, we're against the empire. So they're able let's to get ha- to the blockade and they g- jump to hyperspace. They pull like a Force Awakens where they jump to hyperspace right out of the atmosphere, which yep. I'm not a huge fan of, but that's now just a part of Star Wars. So. Mm-hmm. Well, light speed skipping is also a part of Star Wars now too, which makes zero sense because he skips to light speed in atmosphere. And then winds up already in the atmosphere of other planets, which makes no sense. So, like, he jumps to light speed, ends up on Cloud City or Bespin, but he's, like, already, like, in the planet's atmosphere. He's, like, he appears at a random place in the planet. Anyway, um, so... <laughs> Wait, wait, who are you talking about? What's this? A Poe. Poe, Poe, right, Poe, Poe right. does his light speed oh, skipping, yeah, yeah, which, which, yeah. which pisses off yeah. Ray. But the whole thing makes absolutely no sense. Another reason why well, whatever. We don't Rise of Skywalker is terrible. So, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of how light speed has been treated by the, by the, the current canon in general. But I, how do it's you something feel, I can generally get over. How do you feel about, because I have mixed feelings on this, mm. Uh, other items of the Star Wars uh, universe does this as a nod to, you know, the original films. But so we, I see so much. We make that jump to light speed, and then they hold on the stars, and they start turning them. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, the stars start turning, like, after the jump to light speed. Like, the camera's <laughs> been jimmied by, like, the, the like them taking off. Um they do it a lot in Rebels, and I don't care for it when they do it too much. So Yeah, well, Rebels, I love Rebels, but they clearly had a lower animation budget than Clone Wars, and I think a lot of stuff is reused. <laughs> That's true. Um, that can make sense. But, yeah, I mean, I love Rebels. Uh, where are you at in that? I saw you were watching it on the Plus there. Season 2 somewhere, okay. so uh, in the middle of Season 2. Yeah, the... I love well, season two of the end of that. You're going to be fucking blown away. <laughs> um, all right. So <laughs> I, uh, 
if I th- I'm right on, I think I'm right on what which finale that was. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's basically it. They're headed off. Like these books so far, I'll say this have been very event like they they're very quick, snappy. Mm-hmm. They don't have tons of plotting, which I actually kind of like. Like they they're, yeah, they're, I do too. They're very enjoyable reading experiences. They're Harder to talk about than some of the other books we we, we read. Yeah, because there's is a, there's not much beyond the surface of what's going on in them. So. Yeah, but I I will say I find it very likable, and I find the characters while they're not like they're all archetypes, but they're not like they're kind of fun twists on them. Especially I like I actually really like Crater. I think Crater's a very fun droid. I I know <laughs> I've been very like anti droid on this whole podcast, so I just want to put it out there that. I kind of like Crater. Crater's fun. Oh, you, oh, you like the he like hates alien species. I, Come well, on, yeah, Jim. I like that he's just a dick, and I like <laughs> that there's no real attempt to fully humanize him. Like, there's no AI like sci-fi mm-hmm. bullshit. Like, it's just kind of he's just All a this... prissy, pissy droid who has like some negative human qualities. <laughs> it's always like. <laughs> It's kind of what I like about... Like, I'm just saying, I enjoy him as... He's a fun character. I disagree with his politics, obviously, but he's a fictional character. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. You'll never meet a more dishonest bunch. Oh, my um, God. I want to come back. But, and like... <laughs> I, I don't know. I like that there's a monkey lizard, and I like yeah. I like I like Mork too. Like I think Mork is like a like we don't because like none of the other books that we've read similar to this have had like a pet you know kind of thing that it just like hangs out with them. And Mork, while we haven't had a ton of time with him, is like seems to be really smart, and like so that's like effective. Well, again, like, no, he, like, he, he helps them. He helps like Lena when she goes to meet uh, Dell, and like. Like I just I, I find the crew very appealing and I like mm-hmm. the central mystery is interesting and where they are where the parents are and uh, yeah I, I'm just I, I gotta say I'm enjoying the series it's not like top tier Star Wars fiction but it's like very solid and I thought this was an mm-hmm. improvement on the first one I'm gonna go with an eight out of ten midi florians. Nice, very nice, and I, as usual, agree with all the things said here. This is a very easy read. I I have this reading habit where I usually start it on, like, a Sunday, and then I just read a little bit, chapter by chapter, um, and I'll finish it usually by Wednesday. Uh, This book I finished by Monday, so basically it took me two days, not even two days, to read this book. It's very easy. Uh, It is, I would say, size 30 font, (laughs) (laughs) double-spaced. <laughs> yeah, no, it is like these are like probably about two thirds the length of like your average Jedi apprentice in mm-hmm. reality, but they have the same page count. Yeah. Yes, yes, um, they do. They're um, probably close to like 90, 95 page books, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I like that about them, and I've enjoyed everything so far, so I'm also going with eight. And I also remembered, I, we have to mention, Captain Korda, his boss is Darth Vader, so oh, yeah. maybe, maybe we'll see, Dar- Darth Vader uh, shows up in a, a hologram in this book, cameo, so, yeah. yep, so, uh, but, uh, yep, he, but whatever information the children have from their parents is important the Empire wants this information. So even though they're looking for their parents, the Empire's looking for them, so it's like, you know, they're they're both they both are looking for each other, so uh, but anyway. Um so next week we are reading book two of <laughs> book three, uh, technically, um, The Nest, which is by Tom Huddleston, who is the... Oh, uh, Huddleston. Yes, uh, who is, a, of course, Jeff Bridges' super fan, uh, Tom and Huddleston. Not Tom Hiddleston. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they share writing duties across the series, him and Kevin Scott, and uh, yeah, so The Nest, and we, like we said... Earlier in the episode, we'll be watching the pilot episode of Empty, Empty Nest, Nest for next week. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I'm enjoying Adventures in Wild Space. I'm down. Me too. I'm down for And that. then uh, the week after is when we'll be taking a break from uh, Wild Space for... A few um, weeks. 
few weeks to start Junior Jedi Knights and, of course, our Golden Globe Spectacular. Yeah, we're still not exactly sure what we're doing for that yet, but we'll announce that next week. We'll announce week. next week, yeah. So, uh, come back next week for The Nest and for Empty Nest. And uh, otherwise... <laughs> until then, until the books are due back... The library is closed. Padawan Library is hosted and produced by Tim May and Levi Peretic. It is edited by Tim May. Our theme song is by The Astral Project. Our artwork is by Freddie Funbuns. Padawan Library is copyright 2021. Tim May and Levi Peretic. All rights reserved.